Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today is a Q&A episode and I have three topics I want to dive into. But first, before I do that, I just want to go over a few ways you can help support the podcast. So first, uh, if you found this podcast to be helpful in any way, if you could leave a rating and review and that will help more people find this podcast and continue to get that information out there. It definitely helps there. And I think recently I had a new review on Apple from, I believe, Trance, is it Trance? Uh, Transman 74. So uh, if you're listening, appreciate it. These things are always super helpful. So, you know, again, really appreciate that. So continue to, you know, appreciate the support and everything like that. Next, if you have, so I have my free masterclass on body recomp, what it is, how to do it, literally everything you need to know about body recomp. And the link to that is in the show notes. And again, it's completely free. I also have my free masterclass on nutrition periodization. Again, what it is, how to do it, go over each training each nutrition phase, how to set it up, common adjust, common mistakes, adjustments, again, anything you need to know about it. And I also at the end have a, a case study or I go over how you can sync these all together and come up with a year, two year uh, game plan from that perspective. And again, the link to that is in the show notes. And then lastly, if you've found, uh, I just go off of habit here, but if you haven't yet, give me a follow on Instagram, Jeff, H-O-E-H-N underscore. Uh, that's where I'm most active. If you have any questions on this podcast or need me to follow up on anything, that would be the place to reach out to me uh, too. So with that out of the way, let's dive into today's question. So the first question was around partial deloads. Uh, they just asked, you know, um, are these better? Is this something that we can do here? So first, I think it's probably helpful that we go over deloads, okay? And then I want to review a study from there. So first, what is a deload, right? There's really no kind of good explanation, like good definition. I would say the best definition is just a week where, you know, you dial back training to reduce some fatigue, right? So we're just doing less than what we typically do. That's how I would say we would talk about deloads. And, and my thought on deloads have changed over time, right? It was just like, hey, it needs to be a week. It needs to be this across the board. And I think there's a lot of flexibility. I'll talk about the main like goal of a deload. And when we have that main goal, we can any questions we have around deloads, we can answer it with that. But real quick, I just want to go over a, a study on deloads. It's pretty recent. Max Coleman, I actually had him on the podcast. We talked about this, but basically they the title of it was gaining more from doing less. Uh, the effects of a one-week deload period during supervised resistance training on muscular adaptations. They also looked at strength too. And what they found is, in conclusion, our findings suggest that a one-week detraining period at the midpoint of a nine-week resistant training program appears to negatively influence measures of lower body strength, but has no effect on lower body hypertrophy power or local muscular endurance. So you hear that and you're like, okay, that's not great. However, again, from a, a muscle building standpoint, there was no effect on lower body muscle growth, right? So... And my, my thoughts, the, there's two ways you can take this one. You don't need a deload. It didn't hurt you to deload the, there was, it was no, no impact. So you don't need a deload or two deloading won't hurt your progress. Okay. So there's two ways you can take that study. And I really think it comes down to specifics and uh, a little bit more nuance, but really the main thing here is it's led to like me thinking that they're probably more beneficial from a mental standpoint. And again, they're not going to hurt anything. So it's again, if we feel like we need a lighter week, it's probably great from that. And we probably don't need to have these preset deloads. We can probably do more reactive. But real quick, a couple things I want to go over on the study. So again, some things to consider from the study. So first, it was nine weeks long. What would this look like over longer periods of time? Which obviously with any study, you're going to ask that. When it comes to a lot of nutrition research and training research, especially ones like this where you have participants, it's really hard to go get anything over, say, nine to 16 weeks. So we're always going to be, what's <laughs> what would it be like on longer time scales? But again, we know in nine weeks that if you deload, it's not going to hurt your gains, but it's also not going to improve them either, right? So obviously looking at the, the time frame of it, but we're within that constraint. So again, if you don't deload for 20 weeks, what's that impact going to be over the long term, right? Would it be better to have these weeks built in? Again, we don't know for sure, but again, in nine weeks time frame, uh, there was no positive or negative. Another, in the study, the deload group did not train at all during the deload week. And so typically, most people don't take an entire week off when deloading, right? Usually when we're deloading, we're still doing something. We're just dialing things back a little bit. So would the results be different if they didn't completely take off? If they if they did take off, they didn't, like would, would maybe it now it would lean towards, hey, if you have a week where you just maybe reduce your volume, reduce your intensity, it's, it's actually going to be a net positive. Again, we don't know for sure. Uh, however, this does show that you can't take an entire week off of training if need be. So again, there's two ways to look at this. You could look at it as, oh, they didn't train at all. That's not what's going to happen. Could that have impacted things? Maybe not. But then also, if you do need to take an entire week off of not training, you can certainly do that. They only focused on the lower body. Could this be said 
could this be the same? Could the same be said for the upper body, right? We don't know if that can translate over to the upper body, probably, but we don't know for sure. So again, something to look at. The population was young men and women. Would the findings be the same for other populations? So if you're, when you're 50s, would it make a difference? Is it better to, to have a complete week off? Again, we don't know this. So again, we have to just go with that. So I think also with the strength, one kind of interesting concept too is strength was, lower body strength was impacted in the deload group. So if you are looking for max deep strength, like again, you're like power lifter, you know, it's probably best to make sure you do something uh, versus taking the entire week off, right? That's probably what I would say there. And I think the big thing is strength was impacted because it is skill-based. So taking an entire week off is going to impact things a little bit because you're not putting in the, the reps and you're not continuing to maintain or build that skill. So that's max strength. But again, from a hypertrophy standpoint, there was no downside or, or positive to taking an entire week off. All right, so we'll, I'm going to dive into a little bit more about deloads, um, and then I'll I will get to partial deloads and what that looks like. So first, what's the goal of the deload? It's to drop fatigue mentally and or physically. If there's no is if there's no fatigue to drop, then a deload isn't necessarily. So it's not if we don't have that fatigue, then we don't necessarily need to take a deload, right? So again, no matter what our questions we ask about, was this better? Is, should I do this for my deload? Should I do this? It's we want to make sure we drop fatigue physically or mentally. So again, if someone goes, should I not train at all? I would re reference back to this study. Hey, in this study, it showed that there was no downsides to taking an entire week off. And is this week off of training going to help you recover mentally and physically? And probably would, right? So again, that would be a way to go. Hey, should I do, should I keep the weight the same and just do like less reps and less volume? Again, was that going to drop fatigue? And so again, those would be the questions I would come at it with. Hey, should I do higher reps? Was that going to be more fatiguing? Then again, we shouldn't do that. So again, any questions on how to deload need to answer the question of, will this drop fatigue? So let's go over some times when to deload. So first, physically, are your joints, body feeling beat up? Is progress slowing down? Seems impossible. Are you going backwards in your training? Also make sure to check your overall volume and recovery because you could be doing, you could be doing too much based on that. So a lot of times people think that they're like, they need a deload, but really it's, hey, it's a recovery issue. You need to get better sleep, recover. Maybe you're just doing too much overall, which I guess technically doing less than would be a deload, right? Um, but again, you wouldn't want to look at your recovery too, as I think that's super important. So that would be a time, right? If your body's feeling pretty beat down, you're progressing a lot slower, or maybe it's just, man, even just to match, it seems impossible, or maybe you're even going backwards, then you know, again, we're going to look at our recovery, but hey, that's a sign that you need a deload. Uh, mentally, are you sick of what you're doing? Assuming you've been doing something for at least, say, four to six weeks. If this is the case, switching to a new training cycle may be more prudent than a deload. So it's again, are you just sick of what you're doing? Or it's like you just need that mental break of you just need to not really go in and fo like focus on really pushing your numbers. Again, that's something to take into, into consideration. So there could be a time where you're just sick of what you're doing and all you need is just to maybe go into a new training cycle and maybe just start at, say, two or three RIR and boom, you don't necessarily need to take an entire week of dialing things back. So again, but mental fatigue is something that would make me want to potentially take a deload. Also looking at things outside of the gym. Do you have a vacation coming up? Do you have a stressful week work-wise or life-wise? If so, these would be times you can implement some sort of deload or plan ahead to, to deload in that week. These are all things that I'm asking clients. Hey, where are you feeling? How are you feeling physically? How are you feeling mentally? Do you have something coming up here in the next couple of weeks? And again, if they're like, I'm just feeling pretty tired. It's really hard to match. I'm just, I need a lighter week. And I also have an event coming up in a week. It's boom, next week we're taking that deload, right? So again, those would all be things that I would talk to a client about. So now let's talk about times when a deload maybe isn't as necessary. Because again, people could think that they need one when they don't. And I think really we're talking about an optimization of uh, thing like over a year, right? Is This is where if you take a deload too often and maybe you have these pre-planned deloads when you don't necessarily need them, that's time that you could be pushing your training a little bit more. And I think if you were to just take these pre-planned deloads, I bet you would see a little less progress in somebody who is a little bit more like reactive. Times when a deload isn't necessary, you train with more than three to four reps in the tank regularly. So if you're just always staying far away from failure, you probably don't need to take a deload, right? So this is the person that kind of goes into the gym and they just move, they don't really look like they're working super hard. Okay, the reason you're not seeing gains isn't because you need to take a deload. It's because you need to work harder uh, in, in your workouts, right? Um, so again, if you're regularly leaving three to four reps in the tank, you don't need a deload. I think if you train two to three times per week or less, you don't need a deload. So if, again, if you just train twice a week, you don't need a deload, right? You're just not training enough. This is really more for people who consistently train four to five plus times per week. We don't really need a deload if you feel great, are enjoying training, are progressing, and feel like you can continue to progress. Again, there would just wouldn't be a need to deload unless again, you have something coming up and mentally you're just like, 
you just need that break. But again, if you're feeling great, enjoying training, you probably don't, that's going to cancel you out there with that. If you fall in this category, either sticking with your current training cycle or changing to a new cycle uh, could be options uh, here, right? Let's say you're someone who trains two to three times a week. You've been doing the same program for 12 weeks. I need a deload to go into a new cycle. Probably not. You could probably uh, just end this cycle, um, get some changes in there, drop, uh, increase your RIRs a little bit for a week or two, and then work your way back to where you were versus like, oh, hey, I need a deload. You need to do less, um, et cetera unless you feel like you need it. All right, so let's talk about some ways to deload. So first, you don't have to do all these. You can pick and choose based on how you're feeling. And I find out exactly how to deload a client based on our conversations and their subjective and objective feedback. So a few ways you can deload. So first, you can decrease intensity. So going from, say, zero to two RIR to four plus RIR, that's a great way to to, to deload. So it could that could be you keep weight the same and you just get four reps, three to four less reps than you did the previous week, right? That's one way to deload especially if you don't want to go super light. You could decrease weight, right? Decrease weight by 10 to 20%. Again, that's gonna, that could just be something that you're just like, you're not really gonna change reps, but you're just going to decrease weight. That could be a way to do it. Decrease volume through reps and sets. For example, 10 sets for a muscle group down to six sets per week. And this is the most common one, especially for people building muscle. That's the one that I'll use the most is the decrease in sets, right? It's typically like on average, three sets on stuff. We'll probably drop down to two sets for a particular exercise. That's the most common one from a muscle building standpoint. Decrease how many days you train. So instead of doing four days, you could do two to three that week. That's one way to deload. Again, that's going to decrease the volume, right? So some of these, by doing one, it, it pulls that lever, right? So like example, decreasing weight, that's probably going to uh, decrease that intensity. By decreasing intensity, you could do that via reps or weight essentially, right? Or in the last one here, and this comes back to the original question, only decrease these or some of them on certain body parts that need it. So this is more of the partial deload. So this is certainly something that we can do. This is my long way of getting to this answer is that you can definitely if you feel like certain muscle groups, like maybe you have one on maintenance already, maybe train it a little bit less, there's no need to deload it. You can just keep going with it as you normally do. Or if something's just not feeling like super tired, it's like there's really no need to deload. You don't have to. So again, we can certainly do partial deloads where certain muscle groups we we dial back for that week through one of these one of these ways, and then everything else you you keep the same. Again, that is definitely one way to do it. So my takeaway on this is I am less likely to use deloads now than in the past. And if I do, I am more flexible with how I use them uh, than using a standard approach across the board. So I like to use reactive deloads where we use them on an as needed basis versus a standard time frame. So it's instead of after six weeks, we're just going to deload. Hey, you're in week five, six of this training cycle. I'm going to be checking in with you to see how you're feeling. Hey, let's maybe push it a couple more weeks. Let's see how you're feeling. Hey, we decided to push another week, but you had a ton of stress come up. Hey, let's pull back, right? Or maybe it's, hey, we just pull back on your legs or something like that right? When saying this for clients who push themselves with the proper intensity and say train three to four plus days per week, I do find a deload is, you know, typically needed every six to 12 weeks or so. But again, this is on a case by case basis with that. So lastly, if you, if you deload too often, the downside is that your progress may be a bit slower over time, but it could also keep you consistent long-term, right? So from an injury management standpoint, staying fresh mentally, et cetera. So keep that in mind. I think a lot of times People be like, oh, again, you don't need to deload. That's just time wasted. But if that's something that like keeps you consistent and allows you to push it in those other, say, four to six weeks, and it keeps you your body feeling good, it keeps you motivated for extended period of time. I'd rather you do that than be like, so-and-so says deloads aren't necessary. I don't need to do them. So I'm never going to do them now. And I'm just going to push through that. And then because of that, now you're not giving as much intensity as you could and, or you just not staying fresh mentally. Maybe you're starting to see some little kind of injuries pop up then that's where that information isn't great. So again, I, I just hate this. I hate this. Like when somebody's like, Oh, you don't need a deload. You need to do it this way. It's, we got to take things. We have to go a little bit deeper and we have to look at the context of what's going on. And again, this is the art of coaching. And again, it's easy on social media to be like, Nope, you need to do it this way. And again, that's controversial. It's going to get people to click on it. It's going to get engagement. Uh, so again, I just, that's my thoughts on this particular one. It's yes. Maybe if we were to look at it next, okay, somebody who deloads, maybe they'll see a little less muscle growth in that period of time, but is that going to be something for them that if they didn't deload, they wouldn't have stuck with it for that year. So it's, we need to look into that versus just saying, giving this kind of message that like, if you deload, it's like, oh, that's just for soft people that don't trade hard enough. And I look at my, look at how big I am and I never deloaded. So again, just a few things there, but to answer the question, deloads, you can do it. Uh, I liked, uh, you can do it. It's not going to hurt muscle growth, but it's also not going to increase muscle growth either. Uh, so again, you can 
take it for what it's worth there. And I like to do more of a reactive deload now, right? And reactive is also meaning that it could be a partial deload as well too, and not just necessarily everything. Hopefully that was helpful. You gave, hope, hopefully that was some insights into deloads and now you're armed with that. All right, so next question is, should I adjust my step count when trying to reverse diet? You can definitely do that. You increase your steps from what you were doing previously. You may be able to get away with a bit more calories, right? So it could be like a safety net potentially to do that. But you need to weigh out if the increase in steps is worth a time commitment. Because now it's like, all right. And also you need to make sure that if you do increase your steps, you're not just doing that to maintain your absolute lowest weight. That's something that we need to look at. That's that's a kind of a tricky thing that people go down. So I'm going to in increase steps now. And then now I'm going to stay at this weight. And it's, you're still in like a deficit, right? Uh, or at a, a place where you're not just giving your body enough fuel that it needs. So you do want to be careful with that if you decide to go this route where you do increase your steps during reverse dieting. Because again, it's like now you run that slope of, or that, that slippery slope of, I cannot say that for whatever reason, of still teetering on an energy deficit just to maintain like a, a, a like super lean look or like a low body weight that maybe just isn't where your body feels best and where your body's not going to be best, you know, in terms of building muscle and changing your body composition. So that is something. And then there's also the time commitment aspect of it. Is you increasing two to 4,000 steps worth that extra 30 minutes or 30 to 60 minutes per day to do that. And if it's not, it's to me, that's, I would just rather you really focus on the food side uh, of things with the reverse diet. So in most situations, I, I just have clients keep their steps the same in reverse dieting. We're not going to change it. And if anything, sometimes we'll decrease a little bit, right? Because maybe like during their fat loss phase, they increase their movement a little bit. And again, it's just so high that now we want to bring it down. So in some cases, I'll actually potentially bring it down um, as well too. So again, we need to look at that there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most clients, I'm going to keep their steps the same. I just don't see the need to increase because like I said, now you're going to run that that fine line of continuing with the energy deficit potentially and also with the higher time commitment. So you're not doing what you want to do there with that. All right. So another question I had was, if you're someone who doesn't eat a lot of carbs and you decide to eat a donut or two, is it better to eat them before or after your workout? So this is a good question. So I think first we need to get an understanding of carbs, right? A lot of times people think they're eating carbs and yes, they do have carbs, right? So something like a donut, that's a classic, oh, hey, it's a carb food and, and it is. It has carbs, it has sugar in it. However, what happened here is donuts are also high in fats too, okay? So we do need to take to take that into consideration. Again, people will be like, oh, it's the carbs and whatever. But again, it's going to have a lot of fat, right? So for example, a again, these are just numbers, just quickly Googling this. It says an old-fashioned donut, you're looking at 308 calories, 18 grams of total fat, uh, a bakery glazed donut, 15 grams of, of fat, right? And it's going to have about 30 carbs. Again, it's the fat, it's a food that is high, it's calorie dense food that's high in fat and, ca and carbs, right? This isn't necessarily just a carb source. So again, I see this get confused all the time where it's like, oh, all these carbs, again, cookies, donuts, Nuts, cake, and okay, yes, they have carbs, but they also are high in fat. And that's that magic combination there that really makes it tasty. So just understand that this actually, it does have fats in, in it as well too. And I think that's important because again, people will think that it's just a carb. And again, when we talk carb sources, we're talking ra rice, right? That's something that has little to no fat. Potatoes, again, little to no fat, all carbs. Fruit, little to no fat and all carbs. So ideally, if we were talking carbs, I would rather you have something along those lines around your workout um, from a carb standpoint than something like this, right? However, in saying this, I do think that if you are going to have this type of food, you know, placing it around your workout is probably going to be better than say having it like first thing in the morning um, and then you're not exercising or late at night and you're not exercising, right? Uh, again, I do think it would be better to place it around that. However, what I do want to go it over first is that your total carbs for the day are the most important. How the carbs are going to impact you, what you do throughout the entire day, like days and weeks, like that's most important, right? Uh, again, what you have on the larger time scale is more important than say the timing of it. So again, we need to make sure we understand that. Again, I don't know if this, is this for performance? Is this for body composition? I think that's super important to know, but either way, in, in both of those situations, I think it would be better to have your donut around your workout, right? Next, so basically the most important is your total carbohydrate intake for the day. Next is going to be the timing of those carbohydrates. And ideally when we have this type of food, it would be better placed around activity um, in general, right? Not necessarily workouts, but your activity uh, more, right? So again, I would say that if you are going to have it, that's 
probably the best time to have it understanding, Hey, your total carbohydrate intake for the day is the most important, right? So let's take body composition. For example, let's say for the entire day, you're in a calorie surplus and yeah, you're just in a calorie surplus, right? From body comp standpoint, it doesn't matter when you time your carbohydrates, right? Because you're going to be in a energy surplus for the day and there's not going to be any magic to the timing of it. So again, you need to make sure you get that overall caloric intake down first. But again, like I said, around your workouts, I think it's great. Now, as far as that, would it be better before or after? I think it really comes down to preference. Some people they are going to have this beforehand and then they're not going to feel good afterwards and that's going to impact their training performance. Maybe they feel like it sits in their stomach a little bit or it bothers their stomach and now it's going to impact training. Well, in that situation, I probably would rather have you have it after, right? So I think this is going to come down to some preference here. But I would say probably best case scenario, you have it afterwards. That would be where I would lean towards most of the time. But again, it is preference where maybe you have a donut and boom, now you're just freaking ready to go and ready to crush your workout. Then, hey, that's that would be a good time for you to do it. So under knowing yourself is important there. So I thought that was a pretty interesting question. So that's it for this episode. If you guys have any questions on any of this, uh, you can reach out to me on Instagram. If you have more in-depth questions on, you know, hey, maybe I need to take deloads. How do I know when? Or maybe you need to plan out your next fat loss phase or the phase afterwards, then my free 30 minute strategy call is for you. The link to that is in the show notes. And that is it for this episode. And I will chat with you guys next time.